Hi folks, we're going to talk about some um, specifics having to do with friction, all right, some detail as it has as it applies to an interesting phenomenon. And uh, what we're going to do is a quick little data collection exercise to come up with what might be called a very characteristic graph having to do with friction. And so what I have at my disposal is a, uh, I'm going to make a super crude drawing of it. I've got this electric box that's called a force sensor. It's got a hook on it. And to that hook, I've got a string attached. And to that string, I've got a piece of wood um, with, okay, a block of wood. And, well, this stuff, especially the wood, importantly, is on a table. All right. And what I'm going to do is, well, pull on the, here's my, here, here's my uh, claw of a hand. And I'm going to pull on the uh, force sensor. So, so, well, okay, the, the force sensor is pulled that way, which means that creates a tension on the sensor by the block and, and thus a equal and opposite tension on the block by the sensor. And, well, there will be, because this is, um, well, kind of the real world, there will be a friction force on the block by the table, okay? And what we want to be able to do is measure this friction force. Well, the, the force sensor here, force sensor, the force sensor measures the tension on this hook, all right? So it measures this this tension. Well, that means it measures this tension, at least indirectly. Those tensions are equal. We would love for this tension and this friction force to be equal, because if they are, measuring the tension gives us an indirect measurement of the friction force. As long as tension and friction are equal, we can measure tension, which as it, which is a way of measuring the friction force. All right, so what we want is we want this tension force on block by um, by sensor to be equal to friction force on block by table. We want these things to be equal. We can accomplish that in one of two ways. One way is if block is stationary. Right? The block doesn't move. These forces are equal. The second way is if block moves at a constant velocity. As long as one of those two conditions are met, which is really the same condition, right? We're really saying that as long as a block equals zero, well, that means equilibrium and means by measuring tension, we are indirectly measuring the equivalent friction force. Okay, so I'm going to do that. I've got a nice little uh, um, set of stuff, set of equipment with which I'm going to make these measurements, and I'll show you what they look like in a moment. Now, what I want to mention is the way I'm going to do this, if you read to your left, I'm going to, uh, while the block is initially at rest, I'm going to pull super gradually with a little bit of force, and then a little more, and then a little more, and then a little more, real gradually, until I get the block moving. Once I get the block moving, I'm going to keep it moving at a constant velocity. Forget about the nice and slowly in phase two. That part doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to pull real gradually. And what I mean by that is it might not be, it's not going to be enough force to get the thing moving initially, but I'll pull a little harder. And that might not be enough force. So I'll pull a little harder. And eventually I'll get the thing moving. And once I do, I'll get to my phase two where I move this thing at a constant velocity. All right. And we're going to look at how friction force varies as a function of time. Are you excited? I am. Uh, let me do a little uh, pew and then a little uh, bing do. All right, so uh, ready? I press uh, play and we start pulling gradually a little harder, a little harder, a little harder. There it goes. It just started moving. Oh man. Now that is a gorgeous characteristic friction graph. I'm going to show you again. Let's see if I can repeat that. Pull a little harder, a little harder, a little harder. There it goes. Oh, man, that's another gorgeous friction graph. Now, what I should try, there's a little bit of lag. I'm going to try to do this. I'm pulling. Just started moving. Yeah. i got to get one more because it has to be the best I can do. That's crazy, but fine. 
There it goes. Oh my god, I've never seen a better one in my life. Forget about that first little blip here. But check this out, folks. All this stuff. So forget about this. This doesn't exist. So look, I started pulling. I pulled a little harder and a little harder and a little harder. Look, that says there is a little bit of friction, then a little more, then a little more. And look, I could pull all the way up to here. Well, all the way up to here without the thing moving. But then once it started moving, the friction force dropped off to that much. And this is a beautiful, very, very characteristic graph of, of a fundamental way that friction behaves. All right? And that is what you might see is a time dependence of a friction force that does something like this. Forget about all the spikes and bumps and whatnot. And then ding and then go. Right? We saw that pretty much over and over. You know, there's there'll be a bunch of noise in the signal, but you know, but that's what this thing looks like. All right. And so what does this mean? Well, what it means is for all this stuff, this is all our quote phase one. Right? Phase one. So block is stationary. And here's Phase two block is moving. All right, so what does this tell us? Right? Well, it tells us that for this whole phase one, what we have is a case where there are two surfaces in contact that are not sliding across each other, and that's because of friction. Friction is keeping sliding from happening. All right? So there's no sliding relative of one surface relative to another. And we say that there's a static friction force exerted on the block by the table. All right. And then, well, then this object starts sliding across the table. And then we get, well, w when there is motion of one surface relative to another, oh boy, we call that kinetic friction. Erase. You'll see this as F subscript FK friction force, but it's kinetic. And then you'll see this one as F F S. Sometimes you'll see it. Some people do friction as lowercase f. So maybe we'll maybe we'll see this as lowercase f to make sure we know we're talking about friction. All right, so we have to start to distinguish between what's called static friction and kinetic friction. And the way that you know is it's not about motion. It's about is there sliding of one surface relative to another. Sliding, quite literally, one surface sliding across another. Okay, and so here's what we saw, right? In this part of the graph, our phase one part of the graph, right? What we get for our friction force, as I exaggerate the heck out of this graph, right? It does this. Here's all our static friction force. And then, dink, it drops off. And maybe we'll say pretty darn immediately then it, uh, then it does this. All right, and in between, yeah, I don't know. If there's going to be a change from one force to another, that's got to take some time. We're not interested in that part. What we're interested in is all this kinetic, sorry, all this static friction force. So F, F, S so can range in value. Notice, it can be zero. Right here, start at zero. In the beginning, when we weren't pulling on the block, there's no friction. Eventually, what we get to, hey, 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 eventually what we get to is some maximum F, F, oh gosh, so many subscripts, some maximum amount of static friction that there can be. And so, there might be lots of different amounts of static friction exerted on an object. Again, here's an object sitting on a table that's completely horizontal. How much friction acting on it? None. 
None, literally none. Well, what if you push it a little bit? Well, maybe there's a little bit of friction. What if you push a little bit harder? Well, maybe there's a little bit more friction. What if you push, well, you know, too hard? Well, there maybe can't be enough friction to counteract that pushing. And when that happens, this system will accelerate and start moving. But then if we're careful and we keep the system moving at a constant velocity, that's when we get this. And this part here indicates to us that in red, our phase two says this is, or really this is, this number on the y-axis, F, F, K, is the single kinetic friction force that acts on this object. All right? Now, is it, you know, uh, here we have, okay, fine. That's pretty darn consistent, right? It's not perfect, but that has a nice average value somewhere in there. Right? So the kinetic friction force acting on this, uh, this block is about 3.8 newtons. The maximum static friction force acting on this block is about 5.3 newtons. Notice the static friction force can be anything from zero all the way up to this maximum value, but there's really only one value of the kinetic friction force. And this maximum static force is always ish, always careful saying stuff like that, but for our in, for our purposes as introductory physics students, that kinetic, that static friction force, that peak static friction force is always bigger than that kinetic friction force. That's something we should note. That F, F, S max is greater than F, F, K. Okay? So it's nice to be able to recognize what this graph tells us. It tells us a lot, of, a lot about the way that friction behaves, namely that there can be lots of different values of static friction up to a certain maximum, but kinetic friction, there's a single value of. Now, not a single value for every single case in the world, but for the situation that we have, or for a single situation, a single block surface combination, there is a single one of those. And there's a single one of these, the maximum static force, static friction force. But again, that static force can vary all the way from nothing up to the maximum. All right, so let's talk about um, what that means about, well, how big are these? What does this depend on? What does this depend on? So here's a block that we drag across the surface. All right, um, so let's just say, let's say we, we apply a tension force and there's a friction force. I'll skip the on by notation here, fine. Uh, no, I won't. This is a friction force on the block by the surface. So this is block B, this is surface. Now, the question is, how much friction is there? And like most good questions in physics, the answer is, well, that depends. So it depends on what? The question is, how could I make there be more friction? And I'm not even now talking about maximum static or, I mean, this one is kinetic. We're saying the thing's being dragged across the surface. This block is sliding across the surface. So how could we make it how could we, what kind of situations might there be where there's plain old more friction? What we're really saying is when it would take more force to pull something. So you have to ask yourself, or maybe imagine, what's it like when you have to pull something that it's harder to pull, or that you just have to work harder to pull an object, even at a constant speed? Well, uh, the answers are, sometimes people say, well, uh, if an object was heavier, that would make more friction, or those things are harder to pull. That's not quite it, but it's true in this sense. All right, the other thing has to do with is change the surface combination. And what I mean by that is, well, here's a surface, 
right? And, and then here's a surface, the surface of the block. And what those things are, quite literally what they're made of, matters, right? If you're dragging something across ice or if you're dragging something across a parking lot, well, guess what? There's different amounts of friction. You might have to pull with different amounts of force to make something move at a constant velocity. So those two things, this one really is, this one really is a thing, and we'll get more into that. Um, there's a way to sort of quantify that. But what thing, what surfaces are made of is important as it applies to how much friction one surface exerts on another. Now, the heavier thing we got to talk about. It's true that if this block were heavier, there would be more friction. So that means people sometimes say, so friction depends on how much things weigh, right? And the answer is no. And here's a bit about why. This is a great little, um, a great little. Uh, this is called a uh, diagram, for lack of a better word. This is a nice, not even animation. It's a what is it? A picture? Fine. It's called a. It's a schematic ish of a disc brake, like in your car. Here's where your tire. Sorry. Here's where your wheel bolts on you. These are the studs for your lug nuts. Inside there, there's this metal disc. There's two of them, right? This, these are vents in the middle to help dissipate heat. And those things s rotate at the same rate that your wheels do. Um, and then when you want to stop, well, you press a brake pedal, and that pushes some fluid through this line. It's called a hydraulic system. And that fluid pushes on, um, pushes on a piston that's in a cylinder here. And what it does is this yellow thing here, and this yellow thing here, these yellow things, they make, I'll give you an end on view that's way, way worse. There's the metal disc, and here's one of the yellow things, and here's another one of the yellow things. When you press on the pedal and push fluid into here that pushes this piston uh, against this guy here, what it does is it squeezes these two things, called the um, brake pads, against the disc and that creates friction and if you want to make more friction well you press the brake pedal harder sure what that does is tries to force more fluid into this brake line which tries to push this piston harder which makes these things push harder against the disc and guess what that has nothing to do with it has nothing to do with how much anything weighs right we make more friction when one surface pushes harder against another surface. Okay? When one surface pushes harder against another surface. Now, like we said, it's true here that if this thing gets heavier, mg, there's more friction. But guess what? Changing mg, in this case, changes, that's not good because it's not lo as long, but it changes normal force by the same amount. So in this case, notice we said how much friction there is depends on how hard one surface pushes on another, how hard the surface of the brake pad pushes against the surface of the disc. Again, this thing's the disc. So that surface pushing on surface is normal force. So while it seems like perhaps that heavier things make more friction, it's not about heavy, it's about this. change normal force. So those are the two things upon which friction depends. Friction depends on how much normal force there is, and friction depends on surface combination. And for one thing, I will tell you that friction force is proportional to normal force. If you can double the amount of normal force that one surface exerts on another, you will double the amount of friction force. That's a general statement, but it's true for that. It's also true for the max static force. But generally, it's okay, I think, to say that friction force is proportional to normal force. This one's different. The surface combination thing, how do we do that? Well, we do that uh, bleh, with this. This is called, that's a Greek lowercase mu. The Greeks are weird because they spell their letters with letters. No, they don't, but we do. Mu. Uh, pronounced mu, like a cat. 
And that mu is called coefficient of friction. And what coefficient of friction is, is it's a characteristic, it's a uh, characteristic of two surface combination. I figure typing's nicer. All right, it's a number, quite literally. And actually, it's a ratio of normal friction force, I should say, to normal force. All right, it's true that friction force and normal force are proportional, but their constant of proportionality is this thing called coefficient of friction. All right, and there are two of them. All right, there is one coefficient of friction for when things won't slide across each other, and we call that uh, mu s. That's the coefficient. Co that's not how you spell coefficient. There is another extra ci. Coefficient of static friction. Hence the s. And then there's mu k. So let's just talk about how to draw a mu slash write a mu. People who just don't, do, uh, whatever. It's not hard, but so if my, so my uh, kindergarten, first grade daughter, right? Here, here's a, you get the, you get that line, you get that line. Here's the line in between for the lower cases. A mu looks like this. Y you make a, a U and then you put a thing on the front of it, right? It's a U. A U with a branch in the front. It's not some M. All right, maybe it's it's their M, but fine. They being the Greeks, um, but that's how it looks. A U with a thing. Do your best. So <clears throat> this coefficient of kinetic friction, mu K, And like we said, well, um, we can sort of state two things. One, generally that friction force is proportional to normal force. Two, that mu is this ratio of friction force to normal force. Mu talks about for every, um, for every sort of unit of normal force that one surface exerts on another, how much friction force will one surface exert on another? And this leads us right to, you know, sort of the characteristic equation for friction force, which is mu times n. How much friction force does one surface exert on each other? Well, that depends. It depends on how much normal force one surface exerts on another and what surfaces are involved in the interaction. Right? When we say that mu is a characteristic of a two-surface combination, that means something like, well, there's a, a coefficient of kinetic friction for, here's a popular one, um, like galvanized, Vulcan, Vulcan, not galvanized, vulcanized rubber on asphalt. Well, guess what's made of vulcanized rubber? Tires. Tires are made of vulcanized rubber. Guess what's made of asphalt? Roads. So a coefficient of kinetic friction between galvanized, between vulcanized rubber and asphalt means if we want to know how much friction there is when tires are sliding across a road, which we wouldn't really love to have happen, then we would use the coefficient of kinetic friction involved with that surface combination. So questions will start to talk about what things are made of. It'll say something like a steel box is dragged across a steel plank, a wooden block across a copper they won't do that, but they'll, when, when questions ask about or specifically state what things are made of, what they're telling you is look for, in some reference thing that you will be given, look for what that coefficient of friction is. Okay? Now, generally that's true about friction force. We can apply that to each of the kinetic and the static cases. So this turns into, well, F, F, K is mu K, N. And over here, well, it's not quite so simple. But there is, if we take mu s times n, we can't say that that's very simply 
the static friction force. Because as you hopefully remember, there is an A static friction force. What there are are a whole range of potential static friction forces from nothing all the way up to some maximum possible amount. And so when we talk about the product of mu s and the normal force, that gives us a very specific and only value of the maximum potential amount of static friction force that a two surface combination can um, can create. So far so good? Okay. I'm going to leave that there for now. Um, the subsequent video will talk about using these relationships and some interesting cases, um, particularly when you deal with this stuff. There can be some, some things that are maybe a little bit counterintuitive and you have to be careful of, so we want to pay some close attention to those. Um, but we've laid a good foundation for uh, the factors that affect how much friction is exerted by one surface on another. Um, we've given you some well, some support for maybe a misconception that friction's about how heavy things are, but it's really how much normal force exerts or is exerted on one surface by another. We've shown you this super duper data um, that gives you this real characteristic graph that tells us very clearly, shows us very clearly um, how static friction and kinetic friction behave very differently. All right. So, like I said, we've got a good foundation to get into some more, maybe some more quantitative stuff soon. Okay? Fairly well.